everybody. I appreciate you all being out here this evening. Let me first uh, thank the elders for the opportunity to speak to you tonight. Very privileged uh, to have the opportunity. Uh, it is, I don't know if it's the right word, a little bit stressful sometimes when you don't uh, preach every week, uh, when different ones of us have to do this. There's quite a bit of work that goes into it, which is very good for us to partake in. But um, one of the things that I worry about the most is when I'm responsible for giving a lesson is that I'm truthful. So let me tell you a quick uh, event from this morning that kind of stressed me out to start my day. When I came in this morning, uh, Brother Hulk caught me when I came in the door. And I don't know if I have his words exactly right, but he said something very close to, I have a major problem with your outline. <laughs> and so I was like, oh no. Uh, so luckily it wasn't uh, false teaching that he found in there, but um, our projector's a little bit older out here. And so the format that I sent in this morning, he actually had to go through and edit everything uh, for me tonight. So you can thank him for what you can see on the screen this evening. I had Judith help me edit it at home, but uh, he had to do some extra work to help me prepare for this this evening. But I thank him for that. And again, all the elders for allowing me to uh, have this opportunity. Uh, tonight's lesson will be on encouraging one another to overcome temptation. Um, this is something that uh, affects us all. Uh, when I was preparing this lesson, I, I actually found uh, the outline that I started with somebody had presented this as something he wanted his uh, kids uh, to know. A lot of these lessons here he re was really wanting his kids to know, and I think that's absolutely right. But uh, there's no doubt, as you'll see as we go through this lesson, this is something that we all need to uh, be thinking about and encouraging each other uh, not to be uh, overcome by temptations, but to overcome them. Um, Temptations, as uh, we'll go over a few definitions in just a moment, but temptations are something that leads to sin, as we'll see, and that sin leads us to death, spiritual death and separation from God. Um, but when you think about that word, uh, temptation, I don't know if you're like me, but sometimes when you hear that, sometimes you start thinking a specific thing, and that's one of the things I want to say from the outset. Sometimes we think of this as... Uh, something merely related to lust or that sort of thing, and it absolutely includes that, but uh, really anything that pulls us away into any manner of sin would fall under this category of temptation. We'll be going through several of those things this evening. I'd like to start by uh, reading from Proverbs chapter 6, not too far from the reading we just did a few moments ago, just to kind of go along with that uh, line there that there's a lot of ways that we can sin and sometimes we don't think of some of these. Proverbs 6 uh, verses 16 through 19 says, these six things the Lord hates, yes seven are an abomination to him, a proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift in running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and one who sows discord among the brethren. As you can see, when we go through these right here, at least not bluntly, none of these were necessarily about uh, uh, sensual desires. And some of them may even be surprising as we read through these again, but these are things God hates. Um, you know, especially the proud look. We're gonna get back into more ideas of being proud or having a proud look or having pride in an erroneous way as we go through different points tonight. But there's a lot of things right here. And if you read the rest of Proverbs chapter 6, there's a couple of other uh, pretty heavy hitters in there. And one of them that we may not think about again that often is laziness. And then another point in there is one that you may think of more often, and that's adultery. But all these different things, those seven things listed plus these others, there's all manner of ways that we can get caught up in sin and there's a fine line between uh, temptation and then us acting on that right there. And this lesson tonight is to help one another uh, be encouraged that we don't have to uh, give in uh, to these temptations. A 
Okay, so let's look at a, just a couple of definitions real quick. First of all, in Webster's, especially I really like some of the words they added in right here. I think they're very fitting into the biblical definition that I'll go to in just a moment. But a strong urge or desire to have or do something and then to take that a little bit further, something that causes a strong urge or a desire to have or do something, and especially something that is bad, wrong, or unwise. And that's more of what we'll be getting into tonight. The bad and the wrong, that stuff that leads us to sin, and that's what uh, the Bible wants us uh, to avoid. That's what God's Word is go going to be bringing up to us in the next definition here in James chapter 1. In verses 13 through 15, uh, specifically down around verse 14 and 15, let's just go starting with verse 14. James says, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when the desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin and sin when it is full grown brings forth death. So I want us to focus in on some of these thoughts because what an outstanding definition we have here that uh, covers so much right here, but, but look at some of the things that James said in just those few uh, short verses. Temptation is when we're drawn away by our fleshly desires. So this is a, uh, a battle going on, which we'll get to in a moment, but this is a battle that has to do with those things that we want. It, there's not these desires that we have, they're, put, they're telling us these are uh, evil things that you have that you yourself are involved in selfish things, uh, things that have nothing to do with spirituality. We get drawn away and enticed to do these different things. One implication from this passage is that there is one that entices us, and we're going to spend a lot of time on him in just a moment, and that's the devil who tries to make evil attractive to us in different ways. Another implication in this uh, passage is that we can defeat his attempts without allowing ourselves to sin. Uh, by not letting ourselves be drawn away. So there's a moment in time when we are tempted to do different things that we have a, a quick decision to make and how we handle that is kind of what the lesson is gonna be uh, about tonight. So let's look at several aspects of temptation. First of all, temptation is common to us all. Our flesh is the great battleground in which we war against the devil. And I got a few passages listed there. First, we'll go over to Ephesians chapter 6. In just a moment, I'll be reading a couple of verses from 2 Corinthians. But let's look at this. So it's a, it's a battle. Uh, Paul spends a lot of time talking about uh, uh, the flesh versus the spirit, uh, spirit in his letters. So let's uh, look over here and, and look at some of the encouragement we have. We just sang the... Uh, songs along this line just a few moments ago. But in Ephesians chapter 6, in verse 11, it says, Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Are these enticements that the devil puts out for us? But we need that whole armor of God. Again, this is not physical armor. We're talking about spiritual warfare with spiritual weapons. And then down in verses 14 through 17, look at some of these spiritual weapons that we have. Truth, righteousness, preparation of the gospel of peace, faith, and then down in verse 17, uh, salvation and the word of God. These are the warfare that we need. These are the things that, are, that we're going to have to use to defeat evil. And then over in 2 Corinthians, verses 10, uh, 3 through 5. Paul states, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. And he goes on and finishes that thought through that verse right there. Again, this is a, this is a spiritual battle that we need to recognize that we are in a battle. Uh, and we're in this battle all the time. And we need to be watchful of these things. <clears throat> Continuing this thought about temptation, Satan tries to appeal to us along three avenues of temptation. Over in 1 John 2 and verse 16, John writes, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And so be thinking about these as we go through the lesson further tonight, these ways um, that that we are tempted, these things that the devil uses against us. 
and that continues our next thought right here. Let's look at uh, how the, the Satan has always used this approach. We'll look at a few examples here. Uh, first of all, this is how he came at Eve um, over in Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. We have, we have this uh, temptation of Eve that goes on. It says, uh, now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is not in the midst of the garden, God has said you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Pay strong attention to this now. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. See, God told Eve something, told Adam and Eve something. The serpent comes in right here and says, no, that, that's not fact. Here, here's why. He says in verse 5, for God knows that in the day you eat, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of it, of its fruit and ate. And she also gave her husband with her and he ate. The devil is full of lies and deceit. And we, we see these examples throughout the entire Bible, but we need to take these as more than ex examples. We need to be watchful uh, of these uh, approaches and these things uh, that the devil uses against us because he's always used these. Uh, and, you know, and, and don't undervalue uh, how he tries to get at you with pride. That's the one that sneaks in on us sometimes. And uh, that's one of the ways he really was able to convince Eve right there. Uh, but again, watch his lies and deceit. Another example, this is how he came at David over in 2 Samuel chapter 11, uh, the first 17 verses. We'll just read the first few verses to remind us what's going on here. And then I'll uh, summarize it after that for time. Um, starting with uh, 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1, it says, It happened in the spring of the year at the time when kings go out to do battle that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed, walked on the roof of the king's house, and from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to behold. So David sent and inquired about the woman. And someone said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Then David sent messengers and took her, and she came to him, and he lay with her, for she was cleansed from her impurity, and she returned to her house, and the woman conceived. So she sent and told David and said, I am with child. There's a, there's a lot in that, and if you go on, and we, we know the story well, and you go through the rest of the next uh, 12 or so verses there, very sad story about a man that we actually have documented documented all over the Old and New Testament that loved God a lot. He's one of the greatest examples that we have of somebody that loved the Word of God. Um, but being human and the, we make mistakes, you know, he really piled them on in this one story right here. Looking back at that and then summarizing some of the stuff we skipped over, David's tempted by not turning his eyes away from a, from a bathing woman then he acts on his lust, commits adultery with her. Uh, the sins continue to multiply as his pride takes over and his position and who he thinks he is. And instead of repenting of that sin, he tries to cover it up. He eventually goes on to bring in Uriah back from battle, uh, gets him drunk, tries to get him to go into his wife. Uriah doesn't do so. And eventually David has him put out and essentially murdered. Uh, in battle by putting him uh, to the front lines. Um, and if you think back about to that first verse, it kind of started with idleness, didn't it? I mean, uh, he was normally supposed to be out doing something, but he didn't go the way that kings normally did at that time. And he was idle and his idle, uh, idleness led to him, you know, committing sin and then going further and further with it right there. He had numerous opportunities to uh, overcome temptation at this time, but 
uh, he let the, the lust of, of his flesh and the lust of his eyes and the pride of, of life uh, consume him. And it takes him a while to come to his senses over this right here. But the Satan threw a lot of darts at him in this case right here. And he uh, uh, succumbed to that. Uh, let's look at one more example uh, for the moment. And, th and this is exactly how Satan came at Jesus as well. But if you'll notice in these first two examples that we talked about, that uh, you have two people and more that were overcome uh, with temptation and it became sin. But now let's look at Jesus over in Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. Watch the attacking or trying to attack Jesus' pride here. Uh, we'll come back to Jesus' answer a little bit later. Uh, jumping down to verse 5. He comes at him again. Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written. So now you have Satan uses, you know, uh, twisting the scriptures uh, in an evil manner. He shall give his angels charge over you and in their hands they shall bear you up lest you dash your foot against a stone. And then down in verse eight, again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. And the reading ends there in verse 11 where it says, then the devil left him and behold, angels came and ministered to him. And that was after Jesus told him to be gone. We'll get back to G uh, Jesus' answers, his righteous answers uh, a little bit later. But looking at these examples of how the devil comes at us, here's three uh, very uh, uh, well-known stories that we have uh, throughout the Bible where the, where the devil tempted different ones and, and how we use those uh, three things that we read in 1 John. Let's take this thought a little bit further once, uh, once we succumb to uh, temptation. What does it lead to? It leads to spiritual death. Uh, let's look at James 1.15. We read this a little bit earlier. Uh, it says, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. So we're getting to this uh, spiritual separation that we have from God. Uh, furthermore, uh, as we sang about a little bit earlier, spiritual death is the result of yielding to temptation. Uh, again, we don't have to we don't have to yield to temptation. We we are to fight it off, but when we do, there's a consequence for that. Uh, Romans eight. Uh, let's jump down to uh, verse six. Uh, Paul says, "For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace." And then in the Old Testament when God was talking to Ezekiel in Ezekiel 18 and verse 20, uh, God told Ezekiel, the soul who sins shall die. So that's the result of allowing temptation to cause us to sin. The, the result is uh, death to our soul and separation from God. <clears throat> because of sin, we are in need of the savior, Jesus Christ. Paul, t uh, explains this a little bit in Romans 3, um, really the whole chapter, but for time's sake, we'll jump down to verse 23 and read uh, verses 23 through 25. He says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by the grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as their propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, God has, had passed over all the sins that were previously committed. So God has given us, if we have faith in him, uh, God has given us his son as that perfect sacrifice that can allow us to not, you know, when we do fall, uh, that prevents us from the, from the devil winning this battle. We have a savior. Uh, to help us in these times when we falter. Yes, we have to repent. You have to have the right attitude, uh, but there is an answer uh, for God's people to, to overcome this. Um, 
And I just, I just kind of summarized that point on the bottom of the slide there. By his blood, through obedient faith in him, we have forgiveness when we yield to temptation. So that's not that we should be happy that we yielded to temptation. On the contrary, we should feel terrible and, and make it right. But because of God and his grace and the blood of Jesus, we have a savior that can help us overcome that. One thing to think about, and I guess Romans 3, we, we've kind of introduced this point already, but one thing to think about is, is this battle doesn't end just because we're a Christian. Just because uh, we have become uh, a child of God, uh, once we have been redeemed, this battle is ongoing. The, the, the devil doesn't leave us alone, and he doesn't, uh, you know, pardon us from his time and his evil ways just because he knows that that we love God and Jesus. He wants to separate us from God, so that's his his very goal in this battle that we're in with him. Uh, in James uh, chapter 1, let's actually uh, jump down to verses 12 and 13. James says, blessed is the man who endures temptation, so you know you're going to go through it. That's what he's talking about right here. As Christians, you're going to endure temptation. Uh, blessed is the man who endures it, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those that love him. And then he goes on to say, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he commit to tempt anyone. So even though we're a Christian, we're going to have to endure temptation. And by endure, not that you're just going to have to face it, but you need to overcome it. That's the point. Um, and a little bit further with this point that, you know, the Christian is severely tried by Satan. He comes at, at us and he described, uh, by Peter in first Peter five in a very vicious way. I mean, he wants to take us out in verse, uh, eight of first Peter chapter five, Peter says, be sober, be vigilant because your adversary, the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He wants to devour us. He wants our souls. He wants us to, to go to hell. He doesn't want us to go to heaven with God. That's his main goal. And it doesn't stop uh, once we have been redeemed. <clears throat> so as we mature as Christians, we need to learn how to resist temptation so that we, we do not practice sin. First um, John chapter two and verse one, uh, John says, my little children, these things are right to you so that you may not sin. Many have given in to the false notion that committing sin is inevitable, which it's not. But this is not to say that we are sinless people. We, we know that as well in 1 John 1, verses 8 through 10, uh, specifically in verse 8. Uh, John says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. However, we do not have to give in to temptation. We can stop uh, the pattern of living sinfully. We'll spend the rest of our time uh, this evening looking at what God's word reveals about overcoming temptations and overcoming sin and our adversary, the devil. So here's some ways to help us all overcome temptations, some th things that we need to process in our minds to help us. First of all, we need to know the adversary. We need to recall who the devil is. The devil is an evil, cunning, powerful being, but he's not comparable to our God, and we shouldn't mix those up. This isn't an even battle. I believe Jonathan uh, brought up that point in his lesson uh, a couple of weeks ago. That's something we need to dwell on. This is, this is not even. The devil has no shot at, at winning against God in all this, but that doesn't mean that he's not powerful and doesn't mean that he can't take uh, several people down. That's exactly what his goal is. Over in Genesis chapter three, we already read this, but just this short verse, verse one of chapter three. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. So he's cunning, he's deceitful, he, he's uh, very slick in his manners. But what one thing we need to remember though, that you know he was made, he, he's not God. And those points uh, kind of summarize those on this next slide right here. He's cunning, skilled in using deceit, but he's not all-knowing like our God is. 
he's, his evil present is found all over the world. We see, it, uh, we see it everywhere, but he's not everywhere like our God is. He's not omnipresent. He is not God. He's very powerful. It's like a roaring lion. We just read that. Uh, he, he's a very powerful foe, but he's not all powerful, powerful like our God who created all things in the universe. So let's not make the mistake of giving the, the devil too much credit in this battle. He is a, he is a being that, that wants to take us down and has taken many down and will never stop at trying to take us down, but he is not God. He's not uh, even a God in that way right there. He, he is going to lose eventually. Other things we need to know to help us, know that the devil can be resisted. Uh, we're, we're given this encouragement several times. So let's look at some of these quick verses. James 4 and verse 7, Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. That's very encouraging for us as Christians. Ephesians 4 uh, verses 26 and 27, Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. See, it's not inevitable. He can be resisted. You don't have to give place to him. He can't force you to do anything. Ephesians 6 and verse 11, we already read this earlier, but we're told to stand against the wiles of the devil, those devious strategies that he has for us where he wants to take us down. And then in 1 Peter 5, 8 and 9, actually, let's just go straight to verse 9. We read verse 8 already. We're told uh, by Peter to resist him, steadfast in faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood in the world. So they, these should be encouraging to us. Uh, it's not like the devil can force us to do anything. We, ha we have that free will to fight against his devices. We also, we also should know that the devil's devices are not a secret. Uh, these things that he used, we already went over several of them already, these three avenues that he uses against us all the time and these examples that we have studied about our whole lives, the way that he acts. But we're told that his devices are not a secret. Uh, Paul explains over in 2 Corinthians 2, uh, down in verses 9 through 11, uh, let's just jump down in verse 11 where he's talking about how we should be forgiving, he says in verse 11, lest Satan should take advantage of us for we are not ignorant of his devices. We shouldn't be ignorant. We're told, I mean, if we study, we know how he works. We know, know he's a roaring lion and we know these different approaches that he uses against us. Also over in second Corinthians chapter 11, Paul says in verses 13 through 15, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. He uses false teachers, false doctrine, our, our own weaknesses, and even each other to tempt us to disobey God's will. Another way to overcome temptations is to remember that we are created to obey God's will. That's what he wants for us. Remember that we are, remember that our nature is not corrupt. We corrupt it. Look over at Ecclesiastes 7 and verse 29. You don't have to flip that. I know a lot of these are quick, but listen to what Ecclesiastes 7 verse 29 says. It says, God made, made man upright. We're made that way. You know, some people want to teach. There's a lot of denominations out there that'll teach that you're corrupt from birth told right here that God made man upright. His expectation is this for us to be obedient. We can be upright. We were made that way. Look at what Paul says over in 1 Corinthians uh, 15 and verse 33. He says, evil company corrupts good habits. So we can be corrupted by evil company. We're not made that way. These decisions that we make in life are why people end up being corrupted. We're not made that way. Along those same lines, God's will is not beyond our ability to do it. We can understand it. Look over at Ephesians chapter five and verse 17, where we're told by Paul there, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. It can be understood. Second Timothy three and verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine 
reproof, correction, and for instruction in righteousness. We can understand it. We also can do it. Told in 1 John 5 and verse 3, for this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. It's the expectation. It can be done. We wouldn't be told that if it couldn't be done. It goes on to say, and his commandments are not burdensome. Ephesians 2 and verse 10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. That's why we're created. This new person that we have become when we're baptized into Christ, it's for good works. That's what we should be doing. We can do it. Another way to overcome temptations are we need to use the scriptures. We need to uh, immerse ourselves in God's word. We need to know it. Uh, Jesus used the scriptures. We already, remember I said we'd come back to it when we were in Matthew chapter four and the devil was tempting Jesus in those three different ways. We skipped a few of the verses right there. Look what happened to each of those, uh, how, the reaction of Jesus to each of those temptations. In verse four, but Jesus answered and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Jesus is using God's word to overcome temptation. Down in verse seven, Jesus said to him, it is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. And then down in verse 10, then Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Jesus gives us examples of how we should be using God's words to defeat the devil. It can be done. Over and over and over, Jesus' answer was, it is written. He used scriptures to overcome temptation. Jesus is our example of enduring temptations. Over in 1 Peter 2 and uh, verse 21, Peter says, for to... For to this you were called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps. His methods are tried and proven successful. Also over in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 22, right after that, says about Jesus who committed no sin, nor was deceit, nor was deceit found in his mouth. And then the Hebrew writer over in Hebrews 4 and verse 15 says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, talking about Jesus, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. It can be done, and Jesus is our great example of that. Going on along with this uh, thought a little bit further, to lean on the scriptures during temptation, we need to know them. It's one thing when you hear somebody say something uh, about what the scriptures say, but it's our job really to know what they say ourselves. The way this is described over in Psalms 119 verse 11, where uh, it said, your word I have hidden in my heart that I may not sin against you. Our hearts need to be filled with the word of God. And that's one of these defense mechanisms to ward off the devil. Bible study eliminates ignorance of God's will. In John 8, 32, we're told by Jesus, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And that he said that about abiding in his word. Uh, Bible study generates wisdom, this wisdom which we can use to ward off uh, temptation. In Proverbs chapter one, it lists there eight verses. I don't have time for that, but Looking at a few of the verses there in Proverbs chapter one, verse five says, a wise man will hear and increase learning and a man of understanding will attain wise counsel. And then verse seven, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. So we need to know God's word. That's the point there. As a help to all of our families, uh, the next point that I have in here is to place scriptures in and around us during our daily lives. Uh, we have examples of that uh, in the Old Testament uh, that, that use those words there. But I, I just went off on a personal note right here to talk about some things we do in our house. And I think, I think our ladies are very good at this sort of thing. It's not artwork. It's messages that we need to put on our heart. These messages at different places in the heart that, that are in our house that remind us these things that we need to take out of the house with us. Uh, 
I know in our home, I, that's the couple of verses I have right there in Joshua uh, chapter 1 and verse 9. This is in the kids' bathroom. Uh, Judith put a sign in there that says, Be strong and courageous for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. You're trying to every morning, kind of our attempt there is for them to see that message. They're going to be standing there every day and to put that thought in their minds before they leave the house. In our own uh, bathroom, we have a sign in there from 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 13 and verse 7 where it's talking about love. That whole chapter that's talking about love. We, we have a sign in there reminding us uh, from verse 7 of 1 Corinthians where Paul says, Love bear." Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. You know, sometimes when you're stressed out and not acting right, it's good to see that. It's good to look at that and say, you know, I need to be more loving. I need to think about Jesus and the love he's shown for me. And I need to act this way towards my family and other people. So these, uh, these uh, signs and, and different picture frames and having scriptures all over in our lives and your offices and on your computers and your phones. These are important for us to do things like that. And a few other things that I put down, memorizing scriptures or writing down those that apply to maybe some problem areas in our lives. Uh, purpose to make application of those scriptures. We should look at those and say, you know, I'm gonna do a better job of this right here. They're, they're reminders. Another way to overcome temptations, we should pray for deliverance uh, from those. Uh, when Jesus needed strength from God, we have these examples all over the New Testament. When he needed strength, he prayed. In Luke chapter 6, one of the times where, you know, he had, he had healed someone and they're wanting to kill him about it. He had healed a man's hand on, on, on the Sabbath day. It says in verse 12 of, of uh, Luke chapter 6, Now it came to pass in those days that he went out to the mountain to pray and continued all night in prayer. What a great example for us. Uh, before uh, he was crucified, when he was in the, the garden, those multiple prayers that are described to us in Matthew chapter 26. Let's just look at a couple of verses here. Uh, just quickly, verse 39 says, Jesus went, a, this is after he said his soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. He went a little farther in verse 39 and fell on his face and prayed saying, Oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, nor as I will, but as you will. And then he goes on in verse 42 and does this a second time. And then in verse 44 says he prayed this a third time saying the same words. Jesus uh, gave us this example of when times are really tough, you need to lean on God and go to him and pray. Uh, also over in Matthew 6 and verse 13, he taught us to pray for deliverance in the Lord's prayer. Uh, verse 13, we have documented that he said, and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. That's something we need to ask for help with. And then in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13, uh, we're told there that God will make the way uh, in answer to these prayers and, and these struggles that we go through. In verse 13, it says, no temptation has overtaken you except such as common as it, as is common to man, but God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able, but with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. We're, even though things seem really, really hard to bear, we're told that, that we'll have a way of escape. We just have to use it. And then another way that to help overcome these temptations is we need, we need to constantly reevaluate our pattern of life, how we're living, what we're doing. Temptations often come to us when, when we let our guard down. Uh, so I came up with a, a, a few of these ideas for us to think about. Choosing to be around, around the wrong people. Uh, are we doing that? Proverbs 1.10 says, My son, if sinners entice you, do not consent. Don't fall for it. Notice when evil's out there and get away from it. Uh, also, choosing to look upon the wrong things. Uh, this could be quite a bit, but the example here in Job 31 uh, is about uh, a man looking on a young, uh, young woman improperly. It says, I've made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I look upon a young woman? We shouldn't do those sort of things. Uh, over in Math, Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33, do we let our priorities get out of order? When that happens... You're not going to act right. We're told if we seek first the kingdom of God, 
and his righteousness, all these things shall be added to you. And those things, as we're studying that chapter, these necessities of life, those things that we worry about that we shouldn't worry about will take care of themselves if you get your priorities in order. And then another one is when we're not where we're supposed to be, uh, thinking back to David, remember, we don't have to go back to that right there to the chapter, but in Second Samuel 11, you know, he was supposed to be out at battle. And instead, he chose to stay back and be uh, idle, and it, and it led to several sins right there. So we need to be careful about where we are. Are we, are we somewhere where we're supposed to be, or are we in the wrong place? The Bible teaches us to be watchful and, free and flee from temptation. This is uh, something you really can see all the way back in the prophets all the way throughout the New Testament. But uh, here's a few examples of those right there that we need to think about. Uh, Jonathan had this in his lesson a couple of weeks ago. We won't go there now, but in Genesis 39, where, where Joseph fled from Potiphar's wife. And he actually, when he was describing that before he fled at that other time, he was saying, how can I sin against God? Do, do we actually think of things in that way? He didn't say, how can I sin against this person or that person, whatever his immediate thought was, how can I do this and sin against God? But when that temptation comes, sometimes we have to flee. Um, I use the phrase a lot when I'm teaching classes about hitting a pause button, but I'm not sure that sometimes we shouldn't be using the fast forward button and flee from somewhere. We do have to pause sometimes and be careful and stop and think about, am I saying or doing the right thing and turn away from temptation? But at other times we just need to get out of the out of there get out of the situation we're in and and get away from it uh, some other examples second timothy chapter 2 timothy was told to flee he said uh, paul told him flee youthful lust and then he told him to, but pursue righteousness faith love peace uh corinthians were warned to flee in first corinthians chapter 6 they were told in in verse 18 to flee sexual immorality and then the romans were were warned um, and uh, when Paul wrote them that letter, he told them to make no provision for, for sin, give no pathway to it. Uh, down in verse 14, he says, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for, for the flesh to fulfill its lust. If we cut off the pathway, it can't get to you. So it's, a, it's an effort. Uh, it's a thought. You know, I didn't really say anything about it, but on my opening slide, there was a picture. I don't know if you could tell what it was, but it's like, it looks like a gas stove eye, a little knob, and it had from low to high on there, but it was called willpower. I mean, you have to use your willpower to overcome these different things. It needs to be on high alert. So this is, this is kind of a summary of, of the last couple of so slides. Much of our sinfulness comes because we do not learn to break off the associations and activities that give rise to temptation. We need to break away from all evil influences um, and those things that are helping us serve the devil when we shouldn't be so that we're, we can serve God appropriately. Here's that picture again. So um, that pretty much is the lesson. I'm gonna conclude it just by summarizing on two slides here the different thoughts that I brought up right here. Um, temptation's common to us all. It's something we're all gonna have to endure, but we should not let it lead to sin. We must face temptation and resist it. You know, we're gonna face temptation. We can't really get away from it, but what you can get away from is the sin that results from improperly handling temptation. And then the last half of the lesson, we spent all of our time talking about how to overcome these temptations. And here's just a few of those ideas to encourage each other uh, how to fight it off. Remembering who the devil is and that he can be resisted. He's not God. Remembering that we were created to obey God's will. He didn't make us corrupt. We corrupt ourselves. Knowing and using scriptures that will help us to overcome temptations, whether you write them down, but in your Bible studies, having stuff posted at different things, spending time in Bible study, knowing God's word and using it. And then, you know, very importantly, praying for deliverance. Sometimes we, we go through some really hard struggles and we don't need to go it alone. 
We make that mistake far too often. We need to look at what Jesus did and say, you know what, I need to go to God and ask for help because this is very, uh, this is very hard on me and I'm struggling with this. And then constantly reevaluating our pattern of life and making needed changes. That's what the New Testament is talking about when it says that we should be transformed. We don't live in the old ways once we're a Christian. We need to be transformed and, and live our lives for our Lord and uh, put away all these things that, that hold us down. Uh, that's the lesson. I hope it was beneficial to you. Um, sorry if it was uh, kind of long, but hopefully this has been beneficial to you as it was for me putting it together. We'd like to offer this time um, right now for anyone who's here uh, this evening that either needs to start your walk with Jesus tonight, being uh, buried in baptism, to be added to the church, to the Lord's church, uh, starting that walk of life with him. We're prepared to help you with that this evening. Or if you're here and you're struggling, you need to make public confession for something, or you're just asking for prayers from the church for these help, uh, for help in these ways where the devil may be pulling at you and, and, uh, and holding you down. Uh, if we can help you in any way, we ask you to come forward now as we stand and sing.